Good morning. My name is Calvin Samuel, and I'm Methodist Minister for the towns of Hockley, Rochford, and Rayleigh. Welcome to this Covenant Community Online service. We are internationally dispersed, we're socially distant, but we come together in worship as a Covenant community. As many of you will know, throughout the month of August, I'm working with colleagues in the South End and Lee Methodist Circuit, Pastors Steve Mayo and Colin Turner, as we have combined our YouTube services. Colin Turner will be leading our service today. Good morning. Welcome to this service on Sunday, the 30th of August, 2020. Let us begin with a call to worship from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sits them with princes, with princes of his people, he settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. We sing our opening hymn of praise. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My debt to pay From the cross to the grave From the grave to the sky Lord, I lift Sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My debt to pay From the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. As we come to offer these prayers of praise and thanksgiving, I invite you to respond using the words in yellow, which will appear on your screen, or the text in bold type if you're listening on audio and working from a hard copy. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you for another new day that in your grace your love comes to each of us new every morning. We come as your children to praise your holy name and to give thanks to you 
for all your name means to us. Lord of hosts, always with us, we praise your holy name. You are Elohim, God of power and might. You are Yahweh, the one and only God. El Elyon, the Lord who is exalted over all the nations, whose glory is all around us and above us in the heavens. Lord of hosts, always with us, we praise your holy name. When we feel insignificant and passed over, you remind us that you are El Roi, the God who sees, who holds us, chases after us and in loving kindness cares for us. Lord of hosts, always with us, we praise your holy name. When we are overwhelmed and troubled by worries and are overshadowed by towering problems, you come alongside us as El Shaddai, God Almighty, the all-powerful Mighty One, as Yahweh Nissi, our banner, protector and deliverer, who indeed is like the Lord our God, stooping down to lift the needy from the ash heap. Lord of hosts, always with us, we praise your holy name. We praise you, loving God, that when we are in need, anxious or frightened, we know you as Yahweh Yeret, our provider, as Abba Father, one who is totally loving and who can be completely trusted. Lord of hosts, always with us, we praise your holy name. Loving Father, when we are sick in body, mind or spirit or anxious because of the cares of life, we praise you that you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. You are Yahweh Shalom, the Lord who brings peace. Lord of hosts, always with us, we praise your holy name. Amen. A prayer of confession. Lord God, thank you that you are always ready to forgive us even when we do not feel we deserve it. For those times when we may have heard your word but then gone off on our own track, not wanting to see your path, especially when it looked to be rough and stony. Forgive us, Lord, and set us on your path. Lord, for those times when we may have wanted the world and in pursuing it did not give much thought to our souls, Forgive us, Lord, and help us to take up our cross. Lord, we acknowledge before you the times when we were a stumbling block, both to others and to ourselves. Times when we could have been a help to the faith of others, but instead have looked for complications instead of just following you. Forgive us, Lord and help us to follow you. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. 
Amen. Last week in our journey through the Acts of the Apostles, we left Paul and Silas in the Roman city of Philippi. From there they continued on in their preaching tour of Macedonia, firstly visiting Berea where Silas and Timothy stayed on to continue encouraging the new believers, with Paul then travelling on alone to Athens and then on to Corinth. And it's here that we now join him as we listen to the Bible readings for this week from Acts chapter 19. While while Apollo was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, after these things had been accomplished, Paul resolved in the spirit to go through Macedonia and Asia, and then to go on to Jerusalem. He said, After I have gone there, I must also see Rome. So he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he himself stayed for some time longer in Asia. About that time, no little disturbance broke out concerning the way. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the artisans. These he gathered together with the workers of the same trade and said, Men, you know that we get our wealth from this business, who also see and hear that not only in Ephesus but in almost the whole of Asia, This Paul has persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be scorned and she will be deprived of her majesty 
that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. When they heard this, they were enraged and shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city was filled with confusion, and people rushed together to the theatre, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's travels companions. Paul wished to go into the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the, Asia, of the province of Asia who were friendly to him sent a message urging him not to venture into the theatre. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd gave instructions to Alexander, whom the Jews had pushed forward, and Alexander motioned for silence and tried to make a defence before the people. But when they recognised that he was a Jew, for about two hours, all of them shouted in unison, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! But when the town clerk had quietened the crowd, he said, Citizens of Ephesus, who is there that does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the statue that fell from heaven? Since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. You have brought these men here, who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the artisans with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls, let them bring charges there against one another. If there is anything further you want to know, it must be settled in the regular assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. When he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, we heard how Paul and Silas went to Philippi and Thessalonica in Acts 16 and 17, facing hardship and persecution there. So what happened next? They fled persecution in Thessalonica for Berea and then Athens. Paul preached rather unsuccessfully in Athens in the Areopagus and then moved on to Corinth where he met greater success and founded a church there, hence our New Testament letters to the Corinthians. After some years in Corinth, he went on to Ephesus. Paul in this period sounds increasingly like a Methodist minister. No sooner do you get used to them than they move to the next appointment. And in Ephesus, Paul came across disciples already there who only knew of the baptism of John the Baptist. So when Paul asked these disciples whether they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed, their response was, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. That could be the response of so many contemporary Christians, couldn't it? Too many of us operate as though the power of the Holy Spirit is something that's on the very periphery of our experience. Pentecostals are into that. We're Methodists, or we're Baptists, we're Anglicans, we're URC or whatever. We're not so sure we're into that kind of thing. Paul was having none of it. He had them baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. He laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke in other tongues and prophesied. And he did all this for around 12 people. That was the nucleus of the Ephesian church, 12 people. 
Not all churches need to be large to have an effect. Paul spent the next few years in that place, and God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that when handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. That's extraordinary, isn't it? Now, we know of the woman with the issue of blood who touched the clothes of Jesus, and she was instantly healed. But Jesus was still wearing those clothes at the time. Here we're told of fabric that had touched Paul's skin, being used to heal the sick and even to exorcise demonic spirits. That is extraordinary. Enter the seven sons of Sceva. They already had a reputation of being exorcists. Whether the reputation was deserved or not is unclear. But on hearing of Paul's extraordinary success, they thought they could copy him. In the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. We've no idea whether it worked in some cases. It may well have done. But one day, an evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? And the demon-possessed man so overpowered them that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. I really like that story. Sometimes, when we see other people appear successful, we're tempted to think to ourselves, if we could just use their formula, if we can do what they're doing, if we can find the right words, the right music, the right approach, the right strategy, we can have some of their success. But Paul's success came not from the right strategy. Rather, it was because God was doing something extraordinary in that place and chose to work through Paul. The big challenge for us as churches who want to grow, who want to share with others something of the God we know and the faith we hold dear, is that we're often more inclined to search for the winning strategy, and I'm a strategist, so I fall into that category, than we are inclined to search for the God who might choose to work through us. At this point, everything is going incredibly well in Paul's ministry. So well, in fact, that Paul decides that he's accomplished about all that he can accomplish where he is in Western Asia. And he sets his sights on Rome, the capital of the empire, the center of power and influence. If he can establish the gospel, a church, here, then the gospel can reach to the ends of the earth. Let me remind you, all the way back in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, just before his ascension, Jesus told his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Paul can see just how he might get there if he gets to Rome. But then, Just when everything looks like it's going well, everything goes very wrong. Now, if you read to the end of the book, you discover that Paul does eventually get to Rome, but not at all in the way that he planned. Not in triumph, but in trouble. He arrives not in glory, but in jail. And the chain of events that leads to that outcome begins right here in Ephesus with a riot. Like many acts of civil disobedience, the root cause is economic. When large numbers of people began turning to Christianity from idol worship, or at least considering it, demand for the silver shrines of Greek gods inevitably began to fall. The silversmiths worked out that if Christianity spread across Asia, they'd all be out of a job. So they rioted, nice and early. But they didn't say, these Christians are in danger of ruining our jobs. They were much cleverer than that. What they said was, we're Ephesians. Our God is Artemis. That Christian God is a foreign God. And the uproar was so great that Paul ultimately left Ephesus. Never underestimate the pushback you will receive for doing good. Because doing good inevitably works against the interests of people with power somewhere. And they're not going to take that lying down. Moreover, doing good is a spiritual undertaking, ultimately. 
So the pushback we encounter comes not only from vested interests of people in power, but also from principalities and powers. But as we will see in the long run, even when things go badly wrong, even then, God is able to use our disasters for God's glory. That's one of the great things about the story of Paul in Acts. He's far from perfect, but he is used by God. And that sounds like it would make a great mission statement for a church or an individual, doesn't it? We don't want to be perfect. We just want to be used for God's perfect will, whatever that might look like. spirit and truth pouring out the oil of love as my worship to you in surrender I must give my every part Lord receive the sacrifice of a broken heart Jesus what can I give what can I bring to so faithful
My thanks to Calvin for bringing God's word to us today. As we offer our prayers for others and ourselves, let us first pause to invite the Holy Spirit to speak, to apply his word to our hearts and to our minds and lives. Holy Spirit, speak to us in the silence we pray as each of us bows before you. Bring our lives fully into the orbit of your love and grace. Lord, we are your messengers of the good news of Jesus today. May we know your prompting to know when to speak and when to act. May we know your power and direction in how to offer love and care in your name to those we encounter in the week ahead. Almighty God, as your children born in today's world, we lift its peoples and needs to you. For those who are burdened with responsibilities of government and decision making. For those who are ill and troubled. For the many affected by coronavirus and of loved ones snatched away out of sight and touch. For those who are bereaved and mourning loss for medical and care staff, providing treatment and respite for patients, for researchers and scientists as new frontiers of treatment are explored, for relief workers everywhere, and particularly at this time in Lebanon, following the terrible explosions there. For those in the United States of America preparing for elections. For all affected by recent storms, rain and flooding. For all who are working for justice amongst peoples. And for the care of the vulnerable. For those working to care for the world and its delicate interdependencies for those that we love and whose names we bring before you now. Lord, please save, renew, bless, heal, challenge, empower, strengthen, fill and grant assurance of your grace, love and care to all we pray. In your mercy, please hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall.
My grateful thanks to you all for joining us today. My thanks to Sue Howitt and Carol Glendenny for bringing us today's Bible readings and of course to the Reverend Dr. Calvin Samuel for preaching the sermon this morning. A benediction together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Goodbye and may God bless you all in the week ahead. Thank you so very much for joining me for Sunday worship today. It continues to be a privilege to put together these services for you. Thank you too to those of you who were able to join me this week for Prayer for the Day on BBC Radio 4. Uh, I don't know whether you were one of the diehards waking up early at 5.43 to to listen to them being broadcast live or whether like me you were much more sensible. You caught it later on BBC Sounds uh, and uh, listened to it at a much more reasonable time. If you haven't yet had a chance to catch Uh, some of those prayers, uh, you can still find them on BBC Sounds. As we move into September, we move into an interesting period in the life of our churches as a number of our churches begin to return to their buildings. Uh, For our friends in Rayleigh, uh, the plan is to return to the building around the beginning of October, uh, and so they'll be continuing to be part of this Sunday worship for the next four weeks. Uh, Our friends in Rochford will not be returning to the building uh, until December Uh, and so for the next three months or so this will continue to be the main act of worship for our friends in Rochford. Uh, And in Hockley they'll be using a a Zoom service for uh, this month at least for September coming uh, and we'll be looking at ways of returning to the building in due course. So we'll be experimenting with uh, a number of possibilities Uh, but certainly this service here on YouTube will continue. 9.30 a.m. British Summer Time, uh, so please do continue to join me. And I'm conscious, of course, that there are a number of folk for medical reasons, for all sorts of other reasons, who will not be in a position to return to church in the short term, perhaps even in the long term. And whoever you are, wherever you are, located, whether in this country or somewhere else, uh, you are most welcome to continue to join us here on YouTube for Covenant Community Online Worship. So I'll be back next week, Tuesday, 7 p.m. British Summer Time for Evening Prayer. And that, of course, will be preceded by Tuesday Fast. And uh, Tuesday is a significant moment because that is the day on which I officially become the minister for Hockley. Uh, And so that's this week. And I'll be back next week, Sunday, 9.30 a.m. for Sunday Worship. And next week, we begin Phase 4 of our journey into the book of Acts. Uh, We cover the final nine chapters uh, also. I wasn't entirely sure whether we'd be able to do that online uh, because we may well have been back in our churches by then, Uh, but given that I'll be here, uh, we will finish that journey, journeying from where we are, we were today in Ephesus, uh, tracking the journey of the spread of the gospel uh, to Rome 
and when it gets to Rome, that's the place from which it is able to have a global reach and to become uh, the global faith tradition that it is today. So join me next week as we begin phase four of our journey into the Book of Acts. God bless you.